Well, <clears throat> on Tuesday, it is election day. And uh, I want to talk to you for a few moments just about our country, our nation. Because I honestly believe our nation is at a crossroads. I believe we are at a pivotal point in history. We can either continue down the road where we are headed away from God, we're 17 trillion dollars in debt as a nation. And to be honest with you, we cannot just continue to be printing more money. That's not the answer. <clears throat> Spiritually, I believe we need to return to God. Because I believe that our nation was founded upon Judeo-Christian principles. I know everyone doesn't believe that all of our founding fathers were Christians. I don't know whether they were or not. I'm old, but I wasn't that old. <laughs> but, uh, but I do know that when you study history, you, you, you find a sense that God was present in the founding of our nation. Let me just take a few moments and just read a couple of thoughts with for you and to you. In the summer of 1787, representatives met in Philadelphia to write the Constitution of the United States. After they had struggled for several weeks and had made little or no progress, 81-year-old Benjamin Franklin, isn't that amazing, rose and he addressed the troubled and disagreeing convention that was about to adjourn in confusion. And this is a quote from Benjamin Franklin. In the beginning of the contest with Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayers in this room for divine protection. Our prayers, and he's talking to God, sir, he calls him sir. Our prayers, sir, were heard, and they were graciously answered. All of us who were engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of super intending providence in our favor. Have we now forgotten this powerful friend? That's what he's calling God, his friend. Or do we imagine we no longer need his assistance? Doesn't that sound like today? Have we forgotten our roots? Do we feel like America is so great that we no longer need God's help and assistance. God help us. I believe that one of the greatest dangers to the Christian life is independence. God wants a dependency upon him. And that's what we need as a nation. We need a dependency upon God. He, he goes on to say, I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of man. God governs in the affairs of man. The goal of government based on Scripture was further reaffirmed by individual colonies such as the Rhode Island Charter of 1683, which begins, <clears throat> we submit our persons, lives, and estates unto the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, 
and to all those perfect and most absolute laws of his given us in his holy word. Isn't that a great way to, to, to charter your state and your colony? That's pretty cool. And then, in his inauguration address, inaugural address to Congress, the first president of our nation, George Washington, stressed God's role in the birth of this republic. Here's the quote of George Washington. No people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the indivisible hand which conducts the affairs of men more than the people of the United States. Every step by which they have advanced to the character of an independent nation seems to have been distinguished by some token of providential guidance. We ought to be no less persuaded that the propitious smiles of heaven cannot be expected on a nation that disregards the external rule of order and the right which heaven itself has ordained. And I didn't really know this, but did you know that there are verses to the Star-Spangled Banner? Let me read one of the verses for you. It says, Blessed with victory and peace, may this heaven-rescued land praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause it is just. And this be our motto, in God is our trust. And the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. <clears throat> if you would go to Washington, D.C., you would find scriptures on so many of the buildings that our government has today. In Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, if you could turn there with me, if you have an iPhone, a smartphone, or an iPad, if you have the YouVersion Bible app, you could follow along with the notes. <clears throat> but in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, Isaiah says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. <clears throat> and then this is the phrase I want to underscore with you and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Can we say that together? And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Come on, say it one more time. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful, because he's full of wonders. Counselor, the mighty God, he's an everlasting father. And he's the Prince of Peace. My first point is simply this. We need to return to our Judeo-Christian roots. See, I believe if we return to the root, we'll have good fruit. I said if we return to the root, we're going to have good fruit. Our trust must be in the Lord, not in a political party. And I believe in America, we need a U-turn. I'm going to say that again and hope I get a few more amens. We need to make a spiritual U-turn and get back to the Judeo-Christian roots. We need to return to our founding principles and values. 
God has been removed from our schools, from our government, and from our public life. And I realize that there are many who are even trying to rewrite, rewrite our history. They're called revisionists to tell us that God had no part in our founding. But the devil is a liar. We have strong Judeo-Christian roots. And we need to honor them and return to them. <clears throat> in the book of Revelation, when someone backslides and falls away from God, the Lord says there's three things you need to do. Number one, you need to remember from whence you've fallen. You need to repent. The word repent, nous, means to change your mind. And then you need to return. And you know, I think that's a great formula for America. We need to remember our roots. We need to repent. And then we need to return and get back to the many things that made our nation great. Amen? Let's go to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 13. The second thing that I want to share with you is I pray and I hope that on Tuesday you will vote. But I don't just want you to vote. I want you to vote your values. I want you to vote what you know that you believe, what you know to be true. In Deuteronomy 1.13, when Moses was raising up the elders over Israel, Here's what the Lord said to Moses in verse 13 of Deuteronomy 1. He said, give wise and understanding men and those known to your tribes, and I will appoint them rulers over you. You and I, we need to pray for wise and understanding men and women to be elected into office. We need God-fearing men and women that will uphold the Constitution of the United States. We don't just need politicians. We need statesmen and stateswomen, leaders that will lead us back to God, that will lead our nation on a path that we will get our house in order again. Amen. And you might say, well, what's the use of voting? I'm not interested in politics. I don't trust anyone. They're all the same. The only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. I want to talk to some of you young people here today because you might think, well, that's just not even something that's of interest to me. But listen, when you grow up and you start having children of your own and you realize that the people that we've elected in office are making decisions that are going to directly influence you and your family. You need to understand that today's complacency is tomorrow's captivity. Today's complacency is tomorrow's captivity we've removed God from our schools and it's affected our nation we have legalized abortion and I believe that the millions and millions of unborn thank God they're all in heaven but I believe their blood 
is a stain upon our nation today. Now, I can't tell you who to vote for, but I'm going to tell you how I'm going to vote. Because I can do that without losing our 5013C and without me going to jail. I can do that. I will not vote for anyone that is not pro-life. I won't do it. I won't do it. <clears throat> because if you're not for life, the Lord said, I've set before you life and death. Choose life. If you do not honor life of the unborn, how can you honor and respect life in general? We need, we need that stain removed. And you might say, well, the governors can't, can't change the abortion law. No, but I believe if we get enough pro-life men and women elected to office, I believe we can get that law reversed in our nation and in our land. Amen. Amen. You know, as of October of this year, voters in 31 states voted to define marriage as being between one man and one woman. Thank God. Then, the ruling was sent to the courts where liberal judges overturned the will of the voters. And now we've got dozens of states that recognize same-sex marriage. And that's another reason why you and I have to vote in conservative, pro-life, Men and women that are going to honor the Constitution because they are the ones that appoint these judges. And we need conservative judges so that when rulings like this go to the court, they don't overturn the rule of the, the will of the voters and legalize same sex marriage. Amen. 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 In 2000, the presidential election between Vice President Al Gore and George Bush was decided by only five. 137 votes in the state of Florida where almost two or almost six million votes were cast. 537. That's a margin of 0.00901%. That's like nine hundredths percent. 537 votes out of six million. The Alaska House of Representatives 7th District in 2008, the incumbent Mike Kelly defeated the challenger Carl Castle by four votes. Four votes. That was a margin of 0 0.00997, nine hundredths of a percentage point. Wow. Can you imagine if four more ex Eskimos would have came out of their igloos and went and voted? Could have changed everything. Don't think your vote doesn't matter. Don't think that way. The presidential, the statewide, and the, lo and the local elections, they matter, and we need to vote our values. In Proverbs 29 and verse 2, it says, when the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people mourn. See, we need to elect more righteous men and women to office. Find out how these people that are running, find out where they stand. Find out what they believe. Don't just go by how they look on TV. Don't go by a seven-second sound bite. Don't just vote by party. I remember when I first, <clears throat> I grew up in the city of Duquesne, and when I first got registered to vote, I remember the, the guy that was running for mayor in our town, his name was Caprever, and his slogan was, pull the top lever for Frank Caprever. <laughs> and I thought, what am I supposed to do? Vote for you because your name rhymes with lever? 
It's like, I need to know what you believe. I need to know what you're going to do when you go to Washington, when you go to Harrisburg, when you take office. Are you going to stand up for the values that agree with the Word of God and with what I believe and is important to me? You know, all but two of the country's first 109 universities founded in America were Christian. Did you know that Harvard started out as a Christian university? They got scriptures on their buildings. And now, most colleges and universities are bastions of liberality and ungodliness. But that doesn't surprise me. You know what Hitler said? Give me your children. And I'll change the world. Because if you train up a child in the way that they're to go, when they're old, they'll not depart from it. You got to really pray when you send your son or daughter away to college today. You got to pray that they have instilled in them core values. Because God is no longer welcome in our schools. The curriculum today <clears throat> that they're trying to infiltrate most public schools with <clears throat> is not a godly one. It's not a godly one. And you know, when Lance Walnau was here, he talked about the seven mountains. And it's like, you don't have to be in the majority. All you have to do is be in control of the mountain. A few hundred people in Hollywood control what millions of us watch on television and in the movies. A few hundred people in education control all the information that goes into all the textbooks. A few hundred people in government create and influence the laws that affect 300 million people here in America. And my third point, we got to pray. The prayers of the righteous are what matter. In James chapter 5 and verse 16, I'm going to read out of the amplified version. The earnest heartfelt, continued prayer of righteous men and women make tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. <clears throat> we need to pray for our country. We need to intercede for our leaders. We need to pray that in this election, God sets up one and he takes down another. He opens doors no man can close, and he closes doors no man can open. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. you know it well, if my people. See, God's not waiting for the world. He's waiting for his church. If my people will humble themselves and pray, and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, then he will hear from heaven, he will forgive our sin, and he will heal our land. Our land needs healed. I said our land needs healed. I said our land needs healed. <clears throat> we need to return to our Judeo-Christian roots we need a spiritual U-turn. We need to vote our values, what we believe and what we know to be true. When you leave today, there's going to be some folks out in the parking lot that are going to hand some flyers out that will tell you where some of the candidates, where, what they believe, so that you can go into the voting booth with knowledge. Knowledge is power. Don't go to the voting booth ignorant. God doesn't bless ignorance. 
You know, a lot of times when we go to, to vote, there's people out in front of the, of the voting rooms and they're passing things out here. Vote for this one, vote for that one. I'm not going to vote for somebody because somebody handed me their name right before I walked in. I always say no thank you because my wife and I, we know who we're going to vote for before we get there. We've prayed about it before we show up at the election booth. We know where candidates stand so that we can vote in men and women that are going to abide by the Constitution. They're going to be conservative, they're going to be God-fearing, and they're going to be men and women that can lead this nation back to God. And then we need to be men and women of prayer. We need to be men and women of prayer. We need to pray. And Lord, we do. We pray for our country today. For we have strayed away from you. We pray, God, for this election on Tuesday. Lord, we ask you to make us wise and prayerful. And give us men and women that are wise and of good understanding. Give us men and women in office that are righteous and that are statesmen and stateswomen that will turn our nation around and bring us back to you, Lord. Holy Spirit, help us and take charge of our country. And Lord, let us as a people cry out to you for we know you hear the cry of the righteous. And we pray your kingdom to come on Tuesday and on this election and your will be done in Jesus Christ's name.